My name's Sasha Rosemiel. I'm Vice Chancellor of Sussex, um, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome you all here um, this lunchtime um, to listen to a conversation and a reading, um, a conversation between me and Marina Mahathir, um, and an opportunity for you to ask some questions of one of our many distinguished alumni. Um, and it's, it's a huge pleasure to have you here, Marina, to come back to Sussex uh, to, to talk with me. Um, I've been Vice Chancellor of Sussex for just over a year now, and one of the, the biggest joys of the time so far has been meeting our alumni. Um, we have the most amazing alumni at this university, and in fact, some of them are sitting in the audience as well. Um, and uh, they have done extraordinary things, um, and they have taken their Sussex education um, off around the world um, and held it locally um, in uh, Sussex uh, and in the UK to do really world-changing things. Um, and um, it's just been an enormous... And I've only met a tiny number of them, really, so far. But I've met some extraordinary people. Um, and for those of you who are students at Sussex, um, you are, I, I'm absolutely sure, going to go on and do extraordinary things too. Um, this is going to be the first in a, in a series of events um, where I sit down and talk with some of our extraordinary alumni. Um, and where we make a record of the conversation, because I think we need to archive uh, our history and the extraordinary stories of um, people who've been students at Sussex and, and things that they've gone on to do. Um, and it's a real pleasure to start what I hope will be a, a, a significant series um, of events like this with you, Marina. Um, we met a few months ago now in Malaysia when I was visiting Malaysia, and, um, and I had this idea for doing this, this event in relation to, to you initially because I just thought you've done some incredible things in your life and how wonderful would it be to, for you to come back to Sussex and talk uh, to our current community um, about some of the things that you've done. Um, and of course, it's all helped by the fact that you've written a book. Um, so we have, we have a book um, uh, to persuade you. If you haven't read it yet, please do. You can get it from Amazon, you can get it from all good booksellers. Um, it's called The Apple and the Tree and, and it's a really great read. Um, it's an autobiography. Um, and um, it tells your life story, basically, up until fairly recently. It's not right bang up to date, but um, until fairly recently. Um, and it's particularly um, a story of your relationship with your father um, and how your life has been shaped by being the daughter of your father. But it's not just a story about, about your relationship with your father. It's also the story of a very independent um, woman who has really carved out a very distinctive place in the world through doing some really quite extraordinary things. Um, and just if you don't know um, a little bit about Marina's history, um, Marina is a writer, obviously. She's writ written this book, but she's, she's been writing for many years now. And, and uh, in this book, there is, um, there is an unfolding account, I think, of your life as a writer, um, sort of starting really as with, with your essays at Sussex, but moving through a kind of career... Um, of writing different types of things um, over the years. Um, so Marina is a writer, very, very um, well-established writer who has written a huge amount um, over the years. Um, Marina is also the producer of uh, an award-winning TV series uh, for young women, um, Respect, Relax, Respond. Um, she's been involved in making a major documentary. Um, but I'm particularly interested, we'll, we'll talk about many things, I think, but I'm particularly interested in your activism um, and your, your work, um, your life as an activist, uh, particularly around HIV and AIDS, um, but your activism also for women's rights, um, around issues of gender and sexuality, um, and the role that you've played in, in changing social attitudes um, and, and actually making some kind of quite important political interventions in Malaysia. Um, Marina has been widely recognised for this work, um, so we're certainly not the first people to, to be saying this. In 2010, you uh, became a UN Person of the Year in Malaysia. Um, in 2016, you received France's, hi France's highest award, uh, the Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, uh, which is really quite something. The French don't give these out uh, to foreigners very often, so it's, um, it's, it's really a very significant thing. Um, 2018, we were a bit slower. We gave you an honorary degree at the University of Sussex. Right. Um, and uh, sadly, I wasn't here at that point, but I'm, I'm sure that was a nice occasion. Um, you've been on the board of the um, Asian University for Women. Um, in Bangladesh. Yeah. yeah. 
and um, you have also, you were also, and I think this is, this is a really significant contribution that you made, you were president of the Malaysian AIDS Council for 12 years, um, played a huge role in uh, the struggle uh, around HIV and AIDS, uh, not just in Malaysia, but actually around the world. Um, you've been on the board of Sisters in Islam, um, and you've more recently founded a travel website aimed at women. <laughs> um, I could go on. You've done an amazing array of different things. Um, and uh, the book, as so I'll say again, the book chronicles this um, in, a, in a way that is actually very modest. Um, you know, you don't, you don't quite put it all together until you get to the end and you sit back and think, gosh, that's an awful lot of really interesting and, and amazing things you've done. It's a, really, um, it's a really engaging story, too, that's about the relationship between a very independent-minded woman and her family, um, who's very closely embedded in her family, but also very much carving your own path. I mean, that's, that's what I took from it. I think it's a, it's a book that's about inheritance and you know, what we take from our families, and particularly your relationship with your father, but not just your mother features strongly in, in the book as well. Um, so it's, a, it's a book about family life and relationships, um, it's also about politics and social change and cultural change. Um, so I really recommend the book, but now I want, I want to ask you some questions about it, Marina. Sure. Um, and I'm going to start by saying, what, what made you write the book? Why did you decide to write an autobiography? <laughs> uh, well, I call it a memoir, actually, because okay. I don't think it's entirely my autobiography. Um, well, I've, you know, I've always written, as you said. I've been writing a newspaper column in the largest English newspaper back home, The Star, for a very long time. Um, but always been a little bit dis dissatisfied with it because a column is only so many words, 800,000 words. And I always wanted to write something much longer that allowed me to express things more deeply. And I've always wanted to write a book from start to finish. I've, I've had three, four books they were all compilations of my columns, so not, not very satisfying. So, and I didn't know how to do this, uh, so I, I went off to do um, a master's in creative writing in an, another university. <laughs> um, we do allow that other universities exist, it's fine. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and, um, and I started writing, and you know, it, it really did a lot to stimulate me in, in writing about my memories and, and incidences and things like that. So I was collecting all these little bits of um, writing. And then it so happened that the publisher um, wrote, they just established, Penguin just established an office in Singapore. And they wrote to me and said, would you like to do a book with, you know, and if you could, we'd like to do a book about you as the daughter of uh, your dad. And I said, ah, okay. <laughs> and um, that's how it came to be, really. Um, just a matter of, uh, you know, luck and timing in many ways. And that was during COVID time, so I had plenty of time to sit down and write. <laughs> yeah. And the, the title, The Apple and the Tree. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do, do you want to tell us a bit about that, how you came up with the title? Well, it's, it's in the prologue. Um, I have a daughter, my husband and I have a, a daughter, our youngest, and um, she's a bit of a, a smart ass, I guess. She talks back a lot, and, and every time I scold her or something, she just goes, Apple, Tree. Uh, which, which basically means it's all my fault, <laughs> the way she is. It, it all comes from me. And um, so when I was thinking of a title for the book, I thought, well, yeah, you know, I put apple in the tree, and then, of course, everyone goes, oh, doesn't fall far from, right? And with the book, I'm trying to show that sometimes, yeah, it, it doesn't fall far, but it can also fall differently and that sort of thing. And that does come across very powerfully, actually, um, that uh, you have remained very close to your father and, um, and, and your mother and your family, but also you've done your own thing. Um, you've, you've carved quite a, an independent, autonomous life as well. And that, that I think, is a, it's a really interesting story of how, it, how it's possible to do both. I mean, I don't know if that's how you see it, but for me reading it, I, that's what really struck me. I, I think I've, yeah, I've, I've tried to, you know, st stamp my own imprint, uh, you know, on Malaysian life at least, because 
I felt that I, I just can't just live in this shadow. And you know, my, my dad cast huge shadow, my mom too. And I can either just stay in there or, or come out and do different things. And I think because of my education, my exposure, I, I've thought differently about many things. And uh, the column that I did in the Star, people kept saying, wow, you're really critical, huh? You know, that sort of thing. So I, I, that helped me a lot. And then plus, when I was doing HIV, of course, I had to talk about a lot of things that the government uh, at that time was not talking about or was not very keen on talking about. And so in that way, I guess, it naturally put me different you know, um, not in opposition necessarily, but you know, in, in uh, different, different stance from the government of the day at the time. So I, I know there are some um, Malaysian uh, members of the audience, but there are probably some people who don't know much about Malaysian history and politics. Could you just give us a sort of potted version of, of your dad's political career so people can situate what we're talking <laughs> about here? Um, well, my dad uh, came into office in 1982 as the fourth prime minister, and, uh, and he kept winning re-election, so he was there for 22 years, uh, and then he voluntarily stepped down in 2003, <laughs> yeah. and he was out of government for 15 years, and then in 2018, um, he came back through elections by leading the opposition, what well, was then the opposition, and managed to uh, defeat the government that had been, the party that had been ruling Malaysia for 60 years, which he once led. So <laughs> that in itself is, is a story. Um, so he came back in in 2018 for just short of two years, and then we had some, you know, problems problems like a coup, basically, and then we've changed uh, governments and several prime ministers since. So he was PM4 and PM7. So you really have been um, the, the daughter of a very, very significant global leader um, and uh, you know, major figure on the world stage and, and absolutely in Malaysia and um, Asia as well. Um, but you, you came to school in England didn't yes. you? And yeah. um, to tell us a bit about what it was like coming to school in England, going to go, being, being sent to boarding school, because um, th that's that's a really um, interesting bit of the book. Um, what what it felt like to come here? You were what? Fourteen? No, 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 a bit older. I, I uh -huh. came for A levels. Um, well, I wasn't the first in our family to come to school here. My brother came first. He he had a scholarship uh, from one of the um, uh, local statutory bodies. Um, he and four boys. At that time, there were a lot of Malaysian students uh, coming to the UK uh, that the government was sending because we really needed to kind of fast track our, our university level um, young people, you know, to, because we were developing so fast, we needed all these engineers and, and whatever. Um, so my, my brother was part of an experimental cohort, actually, uh, that the statute body sent uh, for all levels, actually, much earlier. Most of them were coming for A levels. And so he came, and then after that, I was, um, I finished my equivalent of O's back home. Um, and then a lot of my, um, my friends and all were coming over as well. And um, of course, I was hoping <laughs> to come and my dad decided, yes, uh, I, I could go as well. But he didn't want me to get a scholarship. He just felt that, um, People who really needed it should get it, and he'll he'll fund me. Um, we used to call it dad scholarship, you know. Um, but the thing was that, you know, in in those days, travel wasn't so easy. Plus, he was busy; he wasn't PM yet, and he left the choice of the school to 
uh, a friend in the Malaysian Students Department in London. And I, th I actually think my dad saw an ad in some, news, in some magazine for a school and told a friend to go and look and then said, okay, and then I went. So I went to the school sight unseen and I spent uh, only one term there because it was so, I, I really got culture shock, just not just from the coal, but the whole way of, you know, a British public school was compared to schools back home. And after a while, I, I sort of pleaded with him, please take me out of here, I don't like it. And he said, no, it's so expensive, da, 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 da. And then he went to see it. <laughs> and by the time he came to see uh, the school, he had actually entered the government, and he was Minister of Education. And he came to the school, and my, um, the headmistress at the time kept him waiting. <laughs> and he, he wasn't very happy about that. Uh, plus, he didn't like the look of the school, so then he took me out, and then I went to another school. So I had, you know, two schools within a, a few months when I first came to England. Uh, but yeah, that's how I I, I, came. I went from a very dark, uh, quite strict public school to a much more open, small one in Ipswich, which was uh, bleak. <laughs> but I sat down and just got my A's. Yeah. And then came here. And then you came here. And okay, then came so here. you came here. Will you do a little reading about from your book about about Sussex? And, sure, uh, what, sure. What it, like it, it does. What, what year was it you came? Nineteen seventy-six. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone born a good yet? <laughs> yeah. So I, I came straight after after A's. I I, I wanted to be a journalist. So I figured that a background in politics or international relations uh, would be good for it. And um, I can't remember whether Sussex, I had a choice between Sussex and LSE. And I figured if I stayed in London, I'd probably enjoy London too much and I wouldn't study. <laughs> so, so I came to Sussex, not knowing what Sussex was like much. So yeah. And uh, so here's a bit about really my, my time here in Sussex, my first week, and you know, I'll give you an idea of how different it was <laughs> from now. So, um, Sussex at the time had a student population of 3,000 on its small verdant campus with its stark modern buildings in the brutalist style that was fashionable when it was built in the 1960s. By today's standards, that student body was minuscule when compared to the current body of some 17,000 students. Most of the small population of Malaysians were in the science faculties studying engineering on government scholarships. I was the only one I knew who was in the School of Social Sciences, which no longer exists. My friends were mostly other foreign students from Sri Lanka, India, Kenya, although my best friend was an English girl I met in the very first week of the first year. She's not here, unfortunately. She's on holiday in Kenya. In the very early days of acclimatizing to university life, there were many social events meant to acquaint students with one another. At one of these, in my first week at Sussex, I was standing to one side, idly watching other students dancing and drinking. I had only just gotten to know my housemates and had gone with them to the social. Suddenly, a blonde girl, clearly more than a little inebriated, rushed up and yelled in my face, are you Malaysian? My boyfriend is Malaysian and I miss him so much. <laughs> I was not sure how to respond to this. How could she tell I was Malaysian? And what has, has her boyfriend anything to do with me? I feigned this interest and asked where her boyfriend was from. PJ was her reply. <laughs> I lived in the Kuala Lumpur suburb of Petaling Jaya too, having moved there from Alostar when my father joined the government in 1974. What's his name? I shouted back over the pounding music as other students crowded around us jigging about in what the British call dancing. <laughs> She told me, and I started in surprise. I actually knew him. 
Jill Greaterex, that was her name, agreed to meet up the next day at a less noisy corner of campus, and we chatted about mutual friends whom we knew through her boyfriend and their school, United World College in Wales. And that was how I found my best friend at university. Jill lived in Lancaster House, one of the large dormitories on campus, not far from where I lived in Park Village, which also no longer exists. <laughs> we visited each other almost every day, but I spent more time in her communal kitchen because it was larger and had more people coming and going, a sociable place where, while chopping and frying, we talked about lectures and lecturers and gossiped about other students. It was at one of those visits in Jill's kitchen that I learned in the most humiliating way that I had to become my own person with my own opinions. I was sitting on a stool in the kitchen one cold winter day, chatting with her dorm mates as usual, when in walked a tall man looking slightly older than us with light brown buzz cut hair, a long pale face and a serious demeanor. I forget whose friend he was, but amidst the clattering of pots and pans around us, we got talking. His name was Raziel, and he was from Israel. He said he had some Malaysian friends who had told him about Malaysia's new economic policy and how it apparently discriminates against non-Malay minorities. I listened to him, my heart sinking. I'm pretty sure he did not know who I was. All he knew was that I was Malaysian, and that was enough for him to launch into his spiel delivered in a calm, authoritative manner, telling me what was wrong about my own country. If I had been a bit more knowledgeable about Israel then, I might have challenged him about his country's own discriminatory policies against its Arab minorities. But I was a naive young student, more interested in partying than politics and world affairs, and I didn't know how to explain the NEP, a time-bound affirmative action policy to him. Under his relentless questioning, I felt stupid and humiliated and could barely hold myself together. I was being attacked by someone who seemed to be more knowledgeable about my own country, and I felt defensive and defenseless. I'm not sure how I held myself together. Despite the busyness of the kitchen, it felt as if there was only Raziel and me there. Everyone else was either too involved in cooking or other conversations or were politely staying out of ours. Eventually, I managed to extricate myself, went to Jill's room where she was trying to write an essay and burst into tears. I hated Raziel for making me feel small in front of everyone, but most of all, I hated myself for being so ignorant and helpless, unable to defend my own country from these criticisms. That kitchen incident, however, made me conscious about my so-called opinions about many things. Were they my own, or was I just parroting what I had heard my father say? Every time I offered an opinion in class or in conversations with classmates on almost anything that involved politics or world affairs, a little voice inside me said, is that really your opinion, Marina? Or did you just regurgitate what you heard dad say? I think I'll stop there, a bit long. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's very powerful. I mean, it's a very powerful story. It's, I, I completely feel for you. Uh, when I read it, I, I could feel that pain of that moment of being challenged about something that you weren't responsible for, but, you know, it's, it's also very close to you. It's your country uh -huh. um, and your father, um, and you're being kind of held accountable for it, um, yeah. but also you're thinking... I don't actually know enough about this. So it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly... I can see how, in retrospect, it's a kind of transformative moment as well as being very painful at the time. Yeah, I think it was a pivotal moment for me um, to finally decide that I had to think for myself mm. and, you know, have my own opinions about things rather than just sort of just repeating what I hear from other people. I think it's probably quite a Sussex experience too. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask the audience for how, how many of them have kind of had similar moments, but I, I think um, I think it is also what happens at university. Um, you know that it's a moment where people have to become start really becoming themselves. Right. Um, but how much more so if um, you're absolutely at the heart of, of um, a political family and, and, and sort of government? Um, 
I want to just read a little bit that, uh, from your book, if you don't mind. It's just, just going to be a short bit, but um, because I'm going to jump, jump forward in time a bit. Um, um, to how you, your, your involvement in HIV and AIDS activism, which I think is, um, is a really uh, huge part of your life, and you've made an enormous contribution there. Um, and uh, I'll just read this out, and then you can perhaps comment on it. Um, you said, AIDS suited me as a cause because it had a multiplicity of dimensions. Not only did I have to learn about the biological and medical aspects of the disease, but also the socio-political causes of it. There were legal, economic, class, gender, and religious issues to be dealt with to truly understand the length and breadth of the epidemic. It was fascinating and intellectually stimulating, but it could not just be theory for me. My education in HIV came not just from the doctors, scientists, and researchers who worked on the problem, but also from the people most affected by it, the drug users, sex workers, migrant workers, the LGBT community, and refugees. And of course, from many women, both those who'd been infected and those who had to care for their loved ones. Long before it became fashionable, I was getting a crash course in intersectionality. Um, I think that's a, a, a wonderful uh, kind of description, both of, uh, of AIDS, actually, and the sort of complexity of AIDS and HIV as a kind of social, political, economic, cultural problem. You know, you really set that out there, um, you know, with a kind of social scientist's mind about the different elements of it. Um, but also that connection to the lived experience and to yeah. the, to the, the human beings, um, and very often the marginalised human beings, the marginalised people um, who were living with HIV and AIDS and who, who yeah. obviously moved you. So could you tell us a bit about how you got involved in HIV and AIDS as an issue? What, what, sort of, what brought you into it and, and also what you did, what your, what your role has been in, in HIV and AIDS activism? Well, I, I guess I was an accidental activist, really, because I hadn't set out uh, to do anything for HIV. I was very aware of it, um, and I knew there was a global problem, but I hadn't really sought out uh, anyone working in it in, in Malaysia. But I did have very public experience of fundraising and uh, for various causes, uh, for the famine in Ethiopia, wherever, and so um, I, the, the, I first joined the AIDS Foundation, and the trustees at the time uh, knew of my public profile, that I was good at fundraising, and you know, I was the PM's daughter, and so they thought that I would be a great addition to the board. Uh, also, they said they didn't have enough women on it, so they thought I had the right profile. What they didn't realize, and I didn't at the time either, was how involved I was going to get in it and, and what I could actually do for it. So it started off with just fundraising, and then I realized that fundraising for HIV was really difficult because people didn't understand. And they would say things to me like, why should we raise money for these people? That sort of these people sort of uh, words. And so I had to, to really read up on the topic and um, in order to be convincing. And, and then, you know, I got to know who I was working for, really. And I was working for all these groups of people who were very vulnerable because nobody saw them, nobody cared about them, uh, nobody was giving them information, and yet, they were in situations which made them more vulnerable than, than anyone, whether they were taking drugs or they were doing sex work, or they were just in situations where they could not get information. And, um, and that's how it really began. Um, I, I realized that those are the people I'm working for. Those are the people who are going to tell me what it's really like. Uh, to be infected or to be open to infection or to have to care for someone who's HIV positive without help, with stigma all around where you have to keep things hidden. And, um, and before I knew it, I, I was you know, president of the AIDS Council as well as the foundation. So I was doing more than fundraising and I was talking uh, a lot about it. And, bringing attention to it, and, and then suddenly, not just in Malaysia, but around the world, and suddenly it was too obvious. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, AIDS, HIV and AIDS um, was a very, I mean, for, for people who were too young to remember what, what it was like when AIDS kind of broke into public consciousness, certainly in Britain it was, um, it was challenging all sorts of um, cultural norms and uh, it, it demanded, um, but because a social movement started organising, it demanded people to start talking about sex yeah. uh, in a different way, to talk about body parts, to talk about, you know, forms of sexual um, activity that hadn't ever really been talked about in public before. Yeah. Um, and it really did challenge, it pushed at the boundaries of what was acceptable to say um, yeah. in Britain, I think probably everywhere. But um, what was that like to be to be trying to have conversations about sex and about um, <laughs> drug use uh, when, when you started trying to do it? Very, very difficult uh, because, you know, Malaysia is pretty conservative. Um, but we had a big drug problem, actually. That we had a lot of drug users, and that had been uh, a big focus of, uh, for the government and, and everything, but it was treated as a security issue. And so it came under you know, our drug laws, so it came under the police and that sort of thing, not treated as a public health issue. And so we had to spend a lot of time trying to, to make um, the authorities uh, understand that this is a health issue and that it's not just, although drug users were the first line to, you know, first group to get infected because of the sharing of needles very often, but they also had families, they, you know, wives and girlfriends and children and everything who could also uh, not just get infected, but if not infected, then affected because they had to take care of, of uh, the, the father or the husband, whoever. And, uh, and that was hard to, to make the linkages, and especially when talking about women, because most of our drug users were men. And um, in the early days, the number of women who were infected were just like point under 1%. And I remember I was part of a large um, uh, intergovernment, not intergovernment, intragovernment committee on HIV AIDS, and I, I was, you know, saying that, you know, can we talk about how to prevent uh, HIV among women? Because we've seen this in other countries, you know, women were getting infected and they said, oh, when we have a problem with women, we'll talk to you. <laughs> so, you know, sort of like no forward thinking or forward planning. And now we're seeing the, the results of that short-sightedness. But yeah, and, and really talking about so many difficult things, but um, I think, you know, I tried, my colleagues and I tried to be strategic about it. Um, we tried to use as much knowledge and information, and we really up to, you know, updated always with the latest information around the world. And we saw how it progressed from absolutely no treatment, no nothing, to having treatment, to being able to prevent babies from getting infected, women, and all sorts of things. But it's still difficult. It was difficult to talk about condoms, um, talk about sex, uh, education for young people, which was very necessary. And to this day, we still have problems with that. But we just found, we had to find ways. This is a matter of life and death. You can't just give up and say, oh, I can't talk about that. So we worked with all sorts of people. We worked with religious officials. That was really important, particularly the Muslim religious uh, officials, to make them understand that, you know, basically if your flock dies, you don't have anyone <laughs> left to preach to. So, and then we found that on the ground, uh, they really appreciated the knowledge because they were actually facing HIV AIDS in the villages and everything. So, yeah, so, I mean, it's changed a lot now, and, and although the stigma still um, is there, but um, treatment is available for free for Malaysians <coughs> for the most part. Um, you know, there are a lot of celebrities who don't mind lending their name to AIDS courses nowadays, because before they just wouldn't. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, funding given and, and that sort of thing, whereas once upon a time, it was really different. 
Did you find yourself facing backlash for doing this kind of work? <coughs> totally, because, um, well, mostly because, well, I was talking about these difficult things, uh, but also there were attempts to politicize. And because my dad was uh, in office at the time, uh, some of the people who were against him decided to use me as the, as the you know, <laughs> scapegoat or whatever. Um, but I knew what, what they were up to, so I just stuck to the facts, you know. And, and I think that was the, the advantage of being a non-governmental organization, <laughs> that we work on principle and no matter who says whatever that we don't think is correct, whether they're in government or opposition, then we can say something. And I very often did. Sometimes uh, a, a government minister would say something that was incorrect. Uh, sometimes an opposition person would say that, and we treat them uh, the same. Um, did your yeah. dad ever get cross with you about that? I mean, did, did, um, did you have sort of arguments around the dinner table about things that you were doing and saying? Actually, not a lot, because I was fortunate, because my dad's a doctor. Mm. And so he understands the medical aspects. He understands how transmission works and, and how to prevent it. I mean, I think on the medical side of things, biological side of things, he didn't have an issue. He did have some issue with when we talk about rights, <laughs> marginalized groups and all that. But I think he also understands that when it comes to public health, you cannot leave any human being within your area out. Because if you do, that's, that's the gap, and that's how the virus is going to spread. I mean, we saw that with COVID as well. So that much he understood. And, and we had some big issues with, I mean, blood transfusion cases and all that. So we went to see him and said, you know, we have to reassure the public that the blood transfusion system is safe. And that, but occasionally human error will cause something mm. wrong, but generally it's safe. Otherwise, nobody will donate blood. No one will accept blood. So. It, it makes me think about your mother too, um, yeah. because um, the, the apple and the tree is, is primarily here about, about your father, but actually your mother was a doctor as well, and she was yeah. a very senior figure in public health. Yes. Um, so, you know, you have devoted a lot of your life to public health issues, and so, so did your mum. Um, and she sounds like quite an impressive woman from, from what you say about her. I'm, I think she's, she sounds like she, quite a powerful figure too. She is, she is. Uh, I mean, I really could not leave her out of this book because she is a huge influence on us as the family. I mean, she was the second Malay woman doctor in the country and she had spent all her life working. I mean, she's, mm. you know, she's 97 now, but she worked all the way until retirement. Uh, first in the hospital, then in the public health side, and then in the end teaching at a health institute. Um, and and um, she's always been the one to really help the family together. I mean, my father was busy with his political work and all that, but she's always the one who made time for us. And uh, when she came for my graduation here. There's a uh, lovely photo in the book that's too. Right, yes. That's right, that's yeah. right. And, um, and also because when she was doing public health, she was going to the villages. She worked with a lot of the women. She understood the sort of social cultural factors that affected people's health. And she actually wrote a book about it that is still used in the university, in the, in the medical faculty, but how to see how people's beliefs influence the health. Um, so yeah, she's... she's uh, She's, she's great, actually. She's a real inspiration to a lot of women in Malaysia and, and also to, to me and to us in the family. Would she have described herself as, as being into concerned about women's rights? Or is that... Oh, totally. She, she would. She would identify like that, too. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, because of, you know, the way... She, she was the youngest girl in her family and she was the first to go away to university to study to become a doctor in the 50s, uh, which is not a time when people did, actually 19, and before the 50s, because medicine's such a long, <laughs> long course, right? And um, went off to Singapore on her own to, to study. 
and um, and then did all these things, you know. Um, and so she knew she was a pioneer. She knew, I mean, nowadays female doctors in Malaysia is a commonplace, but not during her time. So she knew she was a pioneer in this, and she had to set a good example. And and um, you know, she talked a lot about health. She was a friend of mine from the Family Planning Association found a whole load of old photographs of my mom talking to women about family planning, mm. which I remember she used to volunteer at every Wednesday. And, um, and so she was concerned about, you know, a women's right to her own body and, 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 you know, spacing out children, at least so that they have time for their health, they have time to bring up children properly and educate themselves properly and that sort of thing. So yeah, always, until today. I mean, not too long ago, she was out there marching with <laughs> a lot of uh, women NGOs, you know, against toxic politics and things like that. And I was sharing a, a, a lorry, you know, a back of the lorry and the megaphone with her. It was great. <laughs> she was already 90-something. You know? I want to see the photos of that. That sounds yeah. fantastic. Um, We'll open up to, uh, to questions from the audience in a moment, but I've, I'm interested in the work that you've done with Sisters in Islam too and, and how your faith has been important to you. Um, would you just say something about that? that? That really came out from the HIV work, actually, because, um, like I said, our original cohort of infections were men, but we realised that, you know, a lot of them were married or had partners and... and and the women were at risk. And we were seeing things like, you know, women running back to their mothers saying, um, my husband's a drug user and I, I'm, I think he might get HIV and I'm afraid. Uh, and how do I stop myself? How do I protect myself? And the mothers would say, no, 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 you have to go back. It's your duty. You can never say no to your husband and that sort of thing. It's the same pattern that we were seeing in Africa and in many countries with very traditional cultural norms. And, um, and it became a, a problem, like how do we protect these women? And a lot of it came from beliefs, um, religious beliefs. So we started working with... Um, religious officials uh, to find ways to, you know, because, you know, religion has to be caring as well and, and protect people. At the same time, there, um, I had this bunch of friends who were working on um, domestic violence. And because we were working on uh, enacting uh, legislation against domestic violence in Malaysia. And trying to get it through parliament, a lot of the women's groups were going through it, but there were objections, and all the objections were coming from Muslim men who were trying to say that Muslim men had the right to beat their wives. And my colleagues, who were all Muslim women, journalists, lawyers, academics, and all that, was thinking, really, is that, is that right? So they started a study group and uh, studied the Quran with scholars and found that, that this was really not so cut and dried. Um, that the, the passage that's often cited, 434, was actually about conflict resolution. And it wasn't the first thing, when you beat your wives. You had to talk, you had to find someone to mediate, you had all sorts of things. And then there is a, something that, was, that some people interpret as, as you can beat, or others have interpreted as just leave. So if disputes are impossible to resolve, then, then separate. Um, so then they started uh, by writing a letter to the newspaper talking about these things, and, and that you know, gained a lot of traction. To cut a long story short, it took six years for the legislation to pass through parliament, and another two years before it got gazetted. And then we became the first Muslim country in the world to have a Domestic Violence Act. And I was, I knew um, 
this group. And when they wrote the letter, they called themselves Sisters in Islam. And uh, eventually, they, they formalized that grouping. But I didn't join until much later because I said I was busy with HIV and I just couldn't devote my time. But I could see the synergies. So eventually, 2009, I joined and then I, I was put on the board. And it's been the most stimulating work, really, because really, um, I think we've done so much work in trying to dispel the stereotype that Islam is against women, against women's rights, because there are a lot of rights, some even better than others, uh, those in other um, religions, perhaps. And um, it's, it's a global movement, and I really think the future of the world rests on women, and particularly Muslim women, young Muslim women particularly. So I'm also, the Sisters in Islam is a Malaysian uh, organization, and it's, uh, it's inspired others uh, in Indonesia and all that. And uh, we've also inspired, we started, established a global movement for justice and equality for Muslim women called Musawa, and I'm the current chair of it. <laughs> really fascinating. I'm going to give people in the audience an opportunity to ask questions, if anyone would like to ask a question. I wonder if... Uh, could we put the lights up a little bit? Thank you. Hi. Ah, Hi. It's so loud. Um, a bit shaky because I'm a really big fan of you. Um, I'm Caitlin. I was a student here, and I was the international student officer a year ago. Um, Malaysian as well, sorry. Uh, big fan, if I didn't say it at the beginning. But I... Um, I was wondering what are your thoughts on the political, political landscape in Malaysia, especially the um, youth activism, as I think we kind of enter the what, my... What factorism, sorry? Youth activism. Oh, youth activism. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, I think in the current climate is of the world today, not only here in the UK, but in general, the youth are more empowered to speak on issues that you've also mentioned, but there's also a kind of growing opposition to that, not through governments, but also educational bodies, if you're very familiar with it, in Malaysian education systems as well. I was just wondering what your thoughts were and what you see the future of it as well for that kind of space for our generation. Well, I really think that the, the future of Malaysia lies with young people. Um, and I've really um, been impressed by a lot of the young... I, I work with a lot of young people, especially uh, with sisters, and other groups that I'm, I'm involved with, and a lot of them are, are really led by young people who are, you know, in the old days, you know, you go and study, you come back, and you are a doctor, teacher, lawyer, whatever, and now, you know, people have more um, wider interests, and then a lot of them are joining civil society organizations because, that's where their passion lies, but also it is a viable career move nowadays, you know, because we, we are much better established and we pay better nowadays too. Um, but yeah, I do see a lot of uh, pushback against young people. A uh, fine example is MUDA, uh, which is a youth um, political party, and um, they've had a hard time. I mean, they, they're... They're very enthusiastic, they, they are multiracial, they're very clear about democracy and how it has to be diverse and all that, but the pushback from the more established political parties, even those that you don't <coughs> expect to push back, um, has been quite tough for them. Um, but they're, they're, they're carrying on and, and uh, I hope that they do get somewhere, you know, and a young People have, have just been very, very um, innovative. I think it helps uh, with having a lot of technology and social media to help and all that. Uh, for instance, during COVID, uh, the excuse by the government at the time was that you couldn't have parliament because they didn't want people to get infected, apparently. And so the young people uh, organized a kind of online parliament where they had you know, someone representing every single constituency and they just did it on Zoom yeah. and it was fantastic. All their proposals and all that was fantastic. 
And yet you'd think, you know, I thought, wow, you know, all the political parties should pick up these young people, you know, they're so great. Didn't happen. <laughs> because somehow I see them all as a threat. So I think it, it's, it's going to take a lot of patience and perseverance. Uh, but I, I do, you know, I do hope, I mean, they're doing a lot to educate themselves too on political processes, on strategies and all that, and on issues. So I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful, but I think it's, it's going to take a while to move the juggernaut that is in power right now. Um, even the current government, which is supposed to be supposed to be more progressive and liberal than previous ones, but you know, some people get entrenched or they feel like, oh, we finally got here, so we're not going to move. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to to do much more. But I think there are a group of us older ones who are very happy to support and help them more because for one thing, we want to retire. <laughs> We're like, can we please stop now and you take over? Um, so I yeah, I don't think either your mother or your father yeah, have given you any models of retirement. They're, they're, they're unusual. They have not retired, and I can't see <laughs> you about not, to retire. They're not. Uh, they're not the norm. <laughs> like, yeah. Is there another question? Yes, just here. Um, Hi, and uh, it's just a privilege to be here and sharing the same title of alumni with you. I'm Niamat Zafari. I graduated from MA last year here, and I'm from a very beautiful but a broken country it's called Afghanistan. Oh. You may know it's uh, today marks 779 days the Taliban, you know, banned secondary education for Afghan girls. And when I say Afghan girls, that means three to five million Afghan girls. And in that, I have three, two nephews, included in that numbers. And you know what happened if that number continues from 779 days to 800 days, my third nephew will be also included in that numbers. Mm. Also, today marks 319 days that higher education has also been stopped for Afghan girls. And that means thousands of girls, in which I have a sister as well, who wants to be the first medical doctor in our family. She can't be. But yeah. she will, hopefully, she will make it one day. So I just want to know, what is your reaction on that? First, the second is a request, not a, a question, is because your voice really matters. You know, if you can give me a promise, if you just give one tweet or just one column or one article of you about Afghan girls, well, that will happen. Because some, I mean, people like you should speak up about that situation. It's important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's a Sussex challenge. That's what happens at Sussex. You get challenged to do things. But Well, actually, uh, Musawa, the Global Movement for Justice and Equality for Muslim Women, we did issue a statement when the Taliban uh, came back uh, into Afghanistan uh, about the issue of uh, women and girls uh, and, and education. And um, we are continuing to monitor and we are supporting uh, our, our friends and colleagues who are there. Uh, we've done a lot actually uh, to, um, to train uh, women from Afghanistan on, on their rights uh, um, through Musawa, Musawa's training with something, something called I Engage, which is uh, about equality. And also, uh, when I was on the board of the Asian University of uh, Women in Bangladesh, our, our largest cohort of students was actually from Afghanistan. We had something like 135 uh, girls there. And um, I think some of them are back uh, there, um, but some of them we, we had to help leave because we were really afraid uh, for their future. But I, I think we are talking, we certainly have not forgotten about Afghanistan at all. And I know recently there's also been an earthquake, I think, was there? Yeah. So, you know, there's so many uh, things going on. But we, we really, um, as a movement, we are uh, trying to talk a lot. But, you know, it's, it's, for Afghanistan, it's, it's a bit... It's been a bit difficult, uh, as you can appreciate, you know, that they don't seem to be listening to anyone, but anyone that we can help, any women that we can help who are outside uh, Afghanistan at the moment we try. 
Um, but we, we do keep highlighting the issue of women and girls. And I, I, I really, I wish I understood the logic of not educating girls. I mean, half the population, why would you let it go to waste almost? Um, but yeah, you know, um, we, we do actually keep our, our, our eye on Afghanistan quite a bit. It's part of our mandate, so to speak, uh, on our movement. Yeah. One last question. Hello. Oops, that's really loud. Um, my name's Evie. I'm a current student here. Um, and thank you for such an informative talk. Um, I have a slightly off-topic question, but it does still relate. It's important to bring up because it's such a revolutionary university we attend. And the question concerns student activism. Um, I don't know if you engaged in any student activism while you're at Sussex, um, but we're from a group called Diverse Borders in Sussex. Um, and Sussex University is currently in contract with a company called Mighty, um, and they provide services on campus. Um, and Mighty is a company which invests in border detainment facilities, whether that be like surveillance or physical border divestment facilities. Um, and then obviously Sussex is supposed to be a university of sanctuary. Um, and I just wanted to ask, would you encourage a continuing student activism to stop a resigning of this contract um, with the company that gains its profit from the investment in these facilities? And do you have any experience or advice going forward? Um, yeah, also it would be nice to talk to Sasha afterwards if she's free. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid I have to go to a student okay. experience committee meeting right after this, but um, I don't know if you have anything to say about this. It's a bit, it's a bit off topic from, from talking yeah. about your life and, and your book, but um, if you have any thoughts about student activism, uh, please do offer them. Well, I, when I was here, it, it was quite an active university, student-wise, um, if I remember well. Um, the, First time I ever heard of Nelson Mandela was here because there's Mandela Hall. Um, and there was a little bit going on uh, on university. I don't, I, I wasn't participating very much. I do, but it was a very strange um, time because uh, Sussex had a reputation as being quite a radical left wing university. But I don't know what the activists were doing, but the student council. Uh, was won by the Conservative Party. <laughs> so it was a little bit uh, <laughs> odd in that way. But yeah, I think, you know, I think student activism, and you know, I come from a country where there isn't much student activism on campus because they're not allowed to. There's this university, um, what is it called? University Something Act that prevents. Um, students from getting involved in political activity. Mind you, some, some ex-students are now in government. They're behaving like government. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think this is where you should be learning about activism, really, uh, because it should be a safe space um, before you go out into the real world. And, and you, know, you get exposed to different people, you get exposed to different issues. And I, I think universities should be good training ground, not to the detriment of your studies, of course. But you're seeing um, elsewhere, uh, say in, in America, for instance, you know, on the Palestinian issue, the Harvard University and all that, plus the other side as well. So I, I think student activism is very, impos uh, very important. I, am not, I didn't hear properly what, what you were talking about, this particular company, but, um, I think, you know, there are lots of issues that students can engage on, global affairs, world affairs, rights, human rights issues. It's endless, and especially right now, there, there's, you know, we no end to it. To finish, I'm afraid, because we could carry on talking about this for a long time, because there we are could. many issues that we could talk about. Um, I mean, I think what's one of the things that's really interesting is that you weren't an activist at uh, at university, no. but, you, but <laughs> Sussex was a place that where your where your 
horizons really expanded. Yes. Um, and you went on to do really incredible things, really transformative things. And it's been a huge pleasure reading, both reading your book, and I recommend it to everyone. Please do read the book. Um, but also to talk to you um, today and when we met previously. Um, please stay in touch with us at Sussex. We're, we're very proud of you. Uh, we want you to come back and visit again. Um, and it's been lovely talking to you today. So thank you very much, Marina. Thank you. Thank you.